Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you, uh, Christina, for the introduction. These are my disclosure, and I particularly want to uh, mention that the survey I'm talking about was uh, financially supported by an unrestricted grant of Nestler, but Nestler had absolutely no input on the question we posed on the study design. And actually, uh, I showed yesterday the presentation to them with the results, so up to now they were not even aware of the final results. We only had an interim report. So um, these are my objectives. Um, as we heard in the last talk, it is very important to have a suspicion and then to come to a really correct diagnosis because I've over and under diagnosing is quite common and then treatment and follow up and monitoring. Um, and as you heard, the manifestation are very broad. Um, the acute reactions are easy to recognize, but most of people sitting here are interested in, in GI or work in GI, and then the presentation is very unspecific. It can be GI if there is an undernourished child or with chronic diarrhea, spitting, refusal to feed, but it can be, of course, something else, and that makes our life in daily practice sometimes difficult. So guidelines try to guide the way, and there are several, and there are no major differences between them. And actually, Espegan has published uh, in 2012 a very practical approach, uh, practical guidelines how um, to, to reach a correct diagnosis. And at the same year, we also published the celiac di guidelines. And since I was involved in both of them and invested a lot of my weekends and nights, <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, does this really reach a clinician, the pediatrician, um, do they follow it, or is, or is all what we do and recommend here is for nobody's reading it and following it? So we were really interested in that, and, and since we were planning updates of these guidelines, I mean, what can we do better in order to reach what um, uh, to reach the people with our guideline, and this was the the background of the the survey which we had planned, and we wanted to do that all over Europe, and really, um, uh, and so we we started with a pilot pro, um, project with a survey in Hungary and Germany, and then later reached the other countries, which you see here, and we invited um, these pediatrician via email through their medical pediatric societies. Um, so in order to, to reach it, the right target group. And we had demographic questions, and then we um, had cases, and, and we didn't know, want to know what these pediatricians know. We wanted to know what do they do in their daily practice. Is there anybody in the room who took part? Is there anybody in the room who took part of the survey? No, I don't. Oh, yeah, I see your hand. Yeah, good. So you will see the results. Uh, actually, we gave the results at the end, and we re received a lot of feedback and said, oh, this was wonderful. It was very educational. We learned a lot, because by the end, when they had answered the question, we gave the results and the explanation. And I want to go through with you with the same exercise what we did with this survey. So these were the countries, east, west, north. So we had really quite a representative. We wanted to reach... UK as well, but they didn't take part, so we had an early Brexit at that time already. So these are the countries, and these are, I mean, the large countries had more, so we have quite a representative um, uh, sample, um, more females, like in pediatric how it is, and this is the age distribution of the physicians, and again, I think it's quite representative. 70% worked in pediatric practice, only few in specialized centers, um, and we had young ones, middle and senior physicians, and the majority worked more than 20 years, so quite experienced, but we also had some, some younger people, and the majority were pediatricians, so we reached our target group. Um, the majority had no specialized, there were only 1% gastroenterologists, um, 4% aller um, with allergy specialty, so again, um, the majority were those who see the children first. Now, I, 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 I want to go now with you through these cases which we gave in the survey. So the first one was 
In which of the following circumstances would you switch a three months old formula fed infant with suspected cow's milk proteinology, where you suspect it, from a normal infant formula to a special therapeutic formula, for instance, an extensively hydrolyzed or amino acid based formula? And in each scenario, the only symptoms, um, there was only one symptom which are listed here. And they were asked if they could tick whatever they want, so multiple uh, answers were possible. So one scenario is blood streaked stool for one week, regurgitation after almost every feed, but with good weight gain, excessive crying two hours per day, poor feed intake and weight loss over three, um, of, of 300 gram over the last three weeks, Mild eczema of the cheeks for three weeks, moderate atopic eczema on face and trunk, and none of the above. So you make your choice, um, and I'd give you the answers what uh, we received. And you can see it's all over the place. And again, there is no right and wrong. It's, it's, your, it's your decision, and you will have your, these patients in your practice. So the... What we considered as an, as an indication is really number four, the child with failure to thrive. Um, this could be a case, an indication to switch to a therapeutic for formula to see whether the child improves uh, with um, weight gain. Um, you also could consider it in moderate atopic eczema. Again, you could try topical um, first, but if there is no improvement, then you can could is an option to switch. But look at the others. What we think is not an option yet. The first one is blood streak, and, and you already heard about that. It could be, but the majority of these cases are not. And excessive crying was another, which was ticked quite often. And um, I give you the background why we think two hours in a three months old is not an option, because there was this uh, systematic review on, on crying infants uh, recently published in Journal of Pediatrics. And, and there is this nice graph of percentiles, the, the hours of crying of the percentiles. So this is the 50th percentile, this is the 95th percentiles. So with three months of age, um, two hours, which is about here, you are still at the 75th percentile. So it should be considered quite normal that you, a baby is cus, cus crying and fussing uh, two hours by three months of age. So we don't think that it is a reason to switch. But if this crying would go on or you have other symptoms, then it, it could be. Now, the rectal bleeding, and, and of course it's an alarming symptom particularly for the parents, it's very frightening. They always think, oh, now my child has gastric cancer, because I, uh, colonic cancer, because this is cancer and bleeding in the stool. This is, they are always very scared when they come with these bloody uh, diapers. Um, a little background, tell them it appears in breastfed and non-breastfed infants, and the majority, it's short and self-limiting. So after one week I wouldn't take any action. Maybe I would take a CBC to see, do they get anemia? Is there a correlation? Uh, is there a problem? But I would wait and see, because oh, most of the time, within a few weeks, um, it resolves by itself. Um, people who, who worked these children up and scoped all of these children who came in with rectal bleeding, and these studies have been done, they found um, that the majority of them did not even have eosinophilic colitis. So histology was normal. Even macroscopic findings were sometimes normal. So it's, it's self-limiting and, and only um, a small percentage, it was about 20% of them finally were found out to have cow's milk allergy. So cow's milk allergy is an option, but, um, and, but and, and in this case it would persist, of course. So I would observe the child, look at the thriving, look at other symptoms, is there failure to thrive, and then I would react. But in a thriving baby, um, you can wait and see. Uh, LGG has been tried, the probiotic, but there was no, they were not, no better than placebo. So, of course, what, what is it? Is it a normal reaction? Is it infection, which we don't get? It is gut um, dysbiosis. Um, and a few cases, of course, can turn out to be 
severe um, diseases like infantile IBD and so on. Now, it was interesting when I looked, we prepared this paper, I saw a paper on fecal transplantation. So would one of you consider fecal transplantation in these children? I guess not, but there's a Chinese paper and they did it. They took 19 infants um, with refractory, what they considered is allergic colitis, four to 11 months, they had been scoped and the pictures above looked also to me like allergic colitis. They were enrolled, what they write in the paper, in 2015, I think it was, but 17 anyway. They took mothers, fathers, and siblings for donors. They transplanted. It was not really transplanted. There was no bowel preparation. They only took the stool suspension um, and, and, and gave it to these babies uh, via rectal tube one to five times. And they had surprising results. 17 out of these 19 stopped bleeding within two days. Well, I found that quite traumatic in, in all directions. I have a bit of my doubts, but because when you look close at these pictures, you find that the date of endoscopy was 2009. So something is wrong, at least with this picture. Um, anyhow, uh, I wanted to show you to you that it could be dysbiosis. And by giving this stool from the mother, the father, you may change this. And this maybe brings you to the, to the next talk. Um, so I wouldn't recommend that, but it, I think it is food for thoughts. Next question. A 10 months old had a history of chronic diarrhea, failure to thrive. You would like to rule out the diagnosis of cow's milk allergy in this child. Which of the following investigation is the most useful one? Only one answer. Blood test for specific IgE against cow's milk protein, skin prick test with fresh milk or extract, Endoscopy with small bowel, bowel uh, biopsies, elimination of lactose from the diet, and on improvement of diarrhea and weight gain challenge with cow's milk based formula, elimination of cow's milk diary products from the diet, and on improvement diarrhea and weight gain challenge with cow's milk based formula. So, 10 months old. These were the answers, and the majority were correct. correct. Um, you cannot exclude or prove with a skin prick test or specific eye diarrhea cow's milk allergy. It is a tool, but it's not, neither a proof nor um, an exclusion. So the only thing in these children with suspected enteropathy uh, due to cow's milk allergy is elimination, improvement of symptoms, and then a challenge and the child has to develop diarrhea and symptoms again. So 68% were right, and, um, but again, always consider a positive skin prick test or specific IgE means, sensi means sensitization, and this is not equal to allergy. It's different. And again, if you are not sensitized, you still have may have cow's milk allergy, and here's he pointed to that these are the non-IgE mediated. And also you can always have wrong, falsely negative tests. So a test is never by itself a proof or disproof. And again, to remind you, if you have reactions on the skin, you are more likely to find a child sensitized, but if it comes to the GI tract, um, we, we are dealing more with non-IgE mediated um, diseases. Next question. So the same child, you prove your diagnosis, the child has cow's milk allergy, but he refuses the extensively hydrolyzed formula which you have prescribed. So which of the following options um, are there for formula or foods may be given to the child? And again, multiple answers were possible. Lactose-free cow's milk, soy-based, uh, partial hydrolyzed goat milk, amino acid, butter cookies, milk-free baby cereals, milk-free rice baby cereals. These are the answers. So the correct is soy milk. The child is 10 months, has already complementary feeding. So uh, you, in this situation, you can try soy, soy based because it's not the majority of the feeding in this child. Amino acid based formula is an option, and milk free rice based baby cereals. But I was quite worried that 11% of the 
doctors take goat's milk and you just heard that there is a high cross-reaction, so 90% of the children with cow's milk allergy also react to goat's milk because of this cross-reaction. So it is very dangerous to give cow's milk to them. And um, a partially hydrolyzed infant formula, I mean, if this child reacts to casein and you give a whey-based partial, you may be lucky, but we know that about two-thirds of children with IgE-mediated cow's milk allergy react also to a partial one. So again, it's a dangerous option. It's a bit of a gamble, so don't do that. The next child is a 10-week-old who presented with frequent regurgitation. He is exclusively breastfed. The mother reports pain, and the child is not feeling comfortable. But you look at the child, it looks pretty healthy, uh, normal weight gain, and what... Which of the following options would you prefer? Trial of acid suppressive treatment, for instance, PPI. Trial of extensively hydrolyzed amino acid formula for two weeks. Complete blood count with differential and specific IgE. Referral to radiology for a barium swallow. Reassure the mother and ask to come back in two weeks to reweigh the child. Again, make your option. And 75% were right. That what we also would do, I mean, frequent regurgitation um, in a 10-week-old is not a reason to switch from breast milk to a therapeutic formula. PPI is also not an option. There is a large randomized trial from Susan Orenstein in 160 children, and PPI was in this kind of children of this scenario no better than placebo, um, uh, but there were more adverse reactions with PPI. Next one is a five-month-old breastfed, and he had an acute angio um, edema with swelling of lips and eye lips or an acute reaction uh, after drinking the second bottle of infant formula. The mother brings the child to your clinic a few hours later. What would you advise the mother um, as to which milk infant formula to use? Resume complete breastfeeding and continue uh, with her normal usual diet. Uh, receive complete breastfeeding, but advise her to eliminate dairy products, switch to a supplement with an extensively hydrolyzed infant formula, switch to a supplement with amino acid-based formula, switch to a supplement with soy-based formula. So, and this was a most controversially discussed question. So my approach would be to say, go back to complete breastfeeding, so this was a second bottle, and um, with no exclusion of diary of her diet. The majority ticked that to advise the mother to go on a diary-free own diet. Um, and then there were some who said switch to an extensively hydrolyzed formula. So again, I think we, this needs discussion. And of course, if the mother needs to go back to work, then option three, if the mother wants to or has to, uh, reduce breastfeeding, of course, then um, this is an option. But if the mother um, is still on or, or could afford not to formula feed and, and she's still staying home, then, of course, this one is an option. Um, now, do you really need to exclude a dairy product from the mother's uh, own diet? And this is a question. So, just a reminder, there is no anaphylaxis through mother's milk. So, so what we do, we say, keep your diet, because the mother was on a normal diet up to now, and the baby reacted to the bottle. And if there is no reaction in the baby, then she can continue uh, eating her normal diet. But if the, the baby has a flare of the skin when the mother is drinking milk, then she should reduce or, or, or eliminate um, the milk from her diet. So again, there is no right and wrong, but just to warn you, don't exclude too easily dietary products from the mother's diet because it's burdensome. And as we just heard, these small amounts may induce tolerance. So if it's tolerated by the baby, leave the mother on the normal diet. The mother uh, from this child uh, wants to start weaning food. Um, uh, what would you advise? Start no restrictions avoid uh, cow's milk product um, in the uh, supplements, start weaning by strictly avoiding uh, products with cow's milk, 
protein plus gluten, start weaning, but strictly avoid products with cow's milk protein, other potent allergens such as egg, fish, it, until the end of the first year, and no weaning onto any foods before six months of age. So um, here are the correct answer. Start weaning, but strictly avoid cow's milk allergy. So that is your answer. But you can see that 15 and 25% of the pediatrician um, would uh, avoid other allergens or wouldn't start uh, by cost before six months. But the guidelines have changed recently, and, um, uh, and now the recommendations are that in these children with cow's milk allergy, sh you should introduce supplementary feeding like in all other children uh, and do, do not restrict, and except for cow's milk protein, of course. So, um, do we have time? No, maybe we skip the last question uh, for time reasons, or maybe... Um, we, we, we go to the answer first. So the specific IgE in a five-month-old child the, the, is negative. Uh, in that case, we just had now with the, with the hyphen and the angioedema. Uh, and the mother wishes to know when she can reintroduce dietary product in the diet. Um, and here were the answers. If specific IgE is negative, cow's milk is unlikely. No, we heard it can be no, no IgE. An IgE-mediated allergy is not present. The child should be tested for IgG-mediated cow's milk allergy. There is no test. The acute reaction allow a positive diagnosis of cow's milk allergy in spite of a negative specific IgE. A diet with elimination dairy products is recommended until the age is one year. And here I, I show you the guidelines. And, and the correct answer is, despite the acute reaction to cow's milk protein, the diagnosis of immediate type of cow's milk allergy should be confirmed by a supervised challenge. If the child reacts again, a diet with elimination dairy products is recommended. And I want to bring you to this algorithm. So in this child with the acute reaction, Immediate, a very clear analysis, a second bottle, the, the child reacted. So if the test is positive, you do not need a challenge. You go directly to therapeutic elimination. But if the test is negative, then you should confirm. Because it could be something else, and you, sh you, you should need to know. And then if, if the child reacts, you go to your elimination. But if there's no reaction... You go to your. Uh, you don't. It's not due to cow's milk because sometimes the reaction is to cereal, um, milk, um, porridge, and then it could be the cereal product and not the milk. So I summarize: cow's milk is common. Allergy is common, often under and I, under and, I, under and over diagnosed, and it is up to you really to to make the correct diagnosis. Symptoms, unfortunately, are very unspecific. Fifty percent of eczema. Diagnostic proof um, improvement with diagnostic cow's milk uh, elimination. It's the first step in all cases, and a positive challenge um, after days or a few weeks when symptoms have resolved. Endoscopy is rarely needed, but in all cases of EOE and rarely also in enteropathy. A positive specific IgE or skin prick test is neither a proof nor can exclude the diagnosis. I think this is a very important sentence. Often mothers come and say, my child has no cow's milk allergy because the test was negative. That's not true. Strict criteria are really mandatory in order to avoid misdiagnosis and, and really um, damage to the child, but also unnecessary dietary restrictions to the mother and the child and cost. And the survey results really showed us that education is needed and that's where we are thankful for Nestle to bring up the symposium. And um, I think we have to, to reach a pediatrician that they are well guided to come to the, rect to the correct diagnosis. I want to thank the people, all the people here from the countries who made it possible uh, to help us in the countries to, with the survey. Um, I, I thank Nestle again. And I particularly thank Katharina Workstetter, who, who uh, managed the survey. And these are two students uh, who did her master uh, on the pilot projects. And I thank you for your attention.